I'm here in the uh, Los Angeles studio of Claudio Paducci, who is a contemporary artist within LA. It has been for um, a few years now. Forever. Forever. <laughs> um, thank you, Claudio, for agreeing to be interviewed today. And the very first question I have is, what was modernism? And what does it mean to you? Well, that's way too simple a question for a very, very broad term. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's m most simple. I associate modernism with the desire to distill, uh, we're just talking about modernism in art, to distill art to a kind of pure form that is uh, self-reflective, mm. that doesn't elude, that it, it doesn't, uh, it's not re representational of something other than art. Mm. Uh, that I would say that that's, that's my most broad understanding if I was going to try to get to, to a nutshell yeah. of what modernism is. There are so many offshoots um, that we still think of as, as, as uh, say, movements within modernism mm. that, that stray pretty far from that, that precept, mm. especially some of the ones that I think my work pertains to. Yeah, how does it relate in your work? Because there is, um, there is a level of abstraction that's across the different types of work that you do, isn't mm -hmm. it? The abstraction in my work isn't really abstraction, and my interest in abstraction really only comes about almost accidentally by finding myself make, making work that, ha that, that looked like abstraction and, and uh, playing with that, playing with the tension of, um, of uh, abstraction that's actually language. So the, for me, there's a kind of tension between, between uh, a meaning outside of the artwork it's, it's, itself, and marks which appear abstract, which are read as abstract. Mm. The paintings, in fact, that you have behind you have uh, dots and dashes on them. Right, right. These are, I mean, this work started out very pure. It started out, uh, when thinking about modernism, mm. like, looking like, like Russian constructivism. Like that's, mm. I looked at it and, and said, and it really came out of uh, an idea for a sound piece. I was doing work about survivalism and fear. So war had broken out. First time in my life that America was, you know, so so openly bombing other countries. Yeah. And and there was just such an anxiety, a pervasive anxiety. And I began thinking a lot about, you know, uh, the effect of the barrage of of terrifying, you know, media mm. and and reacting to that. And uh, I remember trying to distill, tr tr trying to, to, to cope with that and thinking about, okay, if, if, if Armageddon is going to happen, what's, what, what, what are the most important things to, to, to do or to think mm -hmm. about? And communication became something that, that I thought would be pretty crucial. Yeah. And it brought me, my dad was a Morse code operator, and it brought me to, to uh, the most simple and easy forms of communication. I, I think it's just a brilliant form of communication. It's too bad it's dead. Yeah. But, um, and I began playing with uh, uh, doing sound pieces, and, uh, and that, you know, that led to using the marks, which of course are these kind of wonderful, simple marks, which most of us look at the way we might look at, you know, Chinese characters or something. It's, mm. They're very abstract. We don't know mm. what they mean, but we know they mean something, and there's yeah. a kind of interesting tension in that. And, and uh, so they started out very, very pure. What they said had meaning to me, and there was this kind of perverse um, poignancy to the idea that they wouldn't be legible to most other people. So do, do you actually understand more if you hear, hear a Really bad I mean, yeah. I, I, make, I mix up a lot of similar letters. Right. You know, like an A and an N, one's a yeah. dot dash, one's a dash dot, and you know, I find when I get too confident about it, I'll, I'll put a work out in the world yeah. that somebody will, you know, let me know that it's, it doesn't say what I think it says. So the sound works were actually, they were, they were more swelling, were they yeah. sort of beeps? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I played with that and then I began notating it like music and then I, I kind of, being a visual artist, I kind of got enchanted with the you know, the, the notation. Yeah. And yeah, so it started out very, very pure. It started out, I got these out, I wanted to show you how it began, which is that I would have these phrases, um, which would be built, each, each of these little frames would represent a, a letter, yeah. a letter of the alphabet. Yeah. 
and these phrases would be built and you'd have you know maybe a whole wall covered with these little frames so what were those two letters in fact uh these two letters are an i and i'm going to be lying if i oh an r an r and an i yeah this is part of a piece that says sirens may sound right and uh sirens may, may sound comes from a manual for a uh, nuclear facility that's right. put out for the workers that oh, gives right. them, I, I, I'm pretty fascinated with manuals yeah. for these types of things. I'm doing a piece right now that comes from a manual for um, Air Force pilots because yeah. manuals tend to be, are trying so hard to be clear yeah. and are so, so not clear. Yeah. So one of the instructions, you know, they had 10 things to be aware of in the event of, an, of a nuclear emergency and yeah. one just said <coughs> sirens may sound. Mm. And uh, I just thought, you know, take that out of context and think about, you know, the, the Greek, you know, sirens and yeah. it, it, um, it just spoke to me. So, so these phrases often are, are um, have enormous meaning to me but are kind of obscure and cryptic for the viewer, I think. Anyway, so they started out really pure, and they've kind of evolved over the years where um, I, uh, uh, I began to be interested in um, playing that abstraction against um, representation. Like, what, what kind of tension would be created uh, if I actually brought representation into it? You know, they look, you know, really different than the, than the initial ones I made, and they are really different, but it's almost like moving backwards away from any kind of modernist ideas. I was going to say also it's um, <clears throat> it's interesting that you talk about language and translation really um, and an abstracted form of language with, mm -hmm. with Morse code mm -hmm. uh, and when you do then translate that to Hamburg, like you said it has that look of you know sort of Russian constructivist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, painting right um, which couldn't be further from yeah, the, the, yeah. the sort of ideology. Yeah, and in many respects, you know, I think back to um, something like Elder Tisky's, you know, the, the, the beating the whites with the red wedge. Yeah, exactly. 1919, it was that work with the, you know, the, the mm -hmm. red wedge attack the, and how that was, it was a poster, wasn't it? It was actually meant to be. They were posters and they were also messages. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, there was yeah. a language element to them. Yeah. You know, uh, especially the Russian constructivism. So much of it was sort of political posters, mm. you know, and political ideology. It was, it's, you know, it's not as, it's not as um, obscure a connection as, you know, when you really think about it. Yeah, yeah. And also, if I think about Kandinsky, yeah. his, you know, mine, mine originated with sound, sound that had meaning, yeah. right? His, yeah. his marks are all about sound. These marks are all about sound. To me, there's, there's a strong sound element uh, at, uh, one's association is, uh, to me anyway, when I see Morse code, my association is the sound of Morse code mm. before it's what, what is it saying, Yeah, you know? And it is a very musical sound, isn't it, because it's rhythmic. Yeah, yeah. and I have a, a music background, I mean, it definitely, definitely um, rings for me. Mm. Um, do you find that the, because when I think about it, you know, what you're doing with language, a lot of it is about translation, and it seems to be a lot of it is about what actually gets lost in that translation right, too. Right, right, definitely. I think that um, a lot of my work, I would have to say, my work really long before I was dealing with language, my 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 interest was in language. I probably draw more from what I read. I read a lot. I read everything you know from novels to to manuals to whatever and and I think it it um, probably has more impact on my work even than than looking does I, mean, I don't know that but I know that that you know long before I was use, actually using language in my work uh, the work would come from language mm -hmm. you know images would come from books that kind of thing what, did, what was the question? I'm sorry. I can't remember either. <laughs> you were talking, oh, you were talking about lost, the lost in translation. Yeah, this is something that from the, from the moment I started making this work, I was so excited about getting to this kind of the 
pure distilling the the construct the building blocks of language yeah. and I would always ask myself the question how important is it to me that what I'm saying be understood mm. it's important when I'm doing it I'm really yeah. care yeah. and yet if people tell me they don't know what it says I also don't really care so I think I, I see a, I see humor in in um, that loss that you know miss translation the gap between you know the understanding that it's trying to say something and the inability to know what it's saying yeah. um, but I also see a kind of consistency in my interests in uh, um, the anxieties connected with communication the idea that that when you most need a language to work yeah. you're most prone not it's most prone not to mm -hmm. you know I think it's more interesting to me you know I like the cryptic. Yeah, it, it, it almost seems to there seems to be almost a psychoanalytic kind of dimension to that, which is this idea, I suppose, that um, you know the linguistic kind of collapses at those moments where you need it, right? And the visual kind of takes over because it's sort of pre-linguistic. Yeah. And kind of, yeah. You know, called psychoanalysis, we uh, yeah. unconscious mind works in images, and yeah. you know, there's um, probably a bit of that. Yeah. I'll well, tell you something else. Yes. Sorry, my brain's still spinning. Yeah. Um, but speaking about you know language and communication and mm. understanding, uh, often what I find is most in, we, we, we live in such a mediated environment now. We have mm. so much language thrown at us all the time yeah. that that it all meaning just blends together and evaporates mm. and. That's that's something that that is really interesting to me. It, it, as someone for someone who cares so much about words and meaning, um, there's there's a kind of humor and poignancy and tragicness to the idea that that we just have so many words around us, none of it has any meaning. Mm. You know, and I know I think that I think that comes out a little bit in, in the work. Certainly when I install a show and and. And there's there's so much language in it. Yeah. It tends to you know dissipate any kind of message. Yeah, I think um, when I think back to myself, you know, I was saying that I started off as a as a painter, and yeah. went into uh, being a theorist, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that led me in that particular career, career direction was um, I wanted to say really clear things. Right with my painting and I couldn't yeah. and it was the interpretation that other people had of my work I found really frustrating and I actually think in hindsight now that that's actually the valuable thing that you know, the visual arts actually does is create this multi -valent. I left yeah. painting for a long time and yeah. in fact my practice today is I happen to be painting right now but it goes in I, I tend to, to um, filter everything I can through painting like yeah. that will be a drawing painting that'll be the first place I try to to do something if it can't be done you know if I need it to be so clear that it can't be done with a painting which tends to resist that type yeah. of meaning anyway I'll make it some other way you know and it'll take me into you know just other kinds of objects um, I like, but so painting is like your default Yes, and what I found is that I, I abandoned painting for other other mediums for, for, for quite some time, for yeah. about four or five years. What I found is that I missed that struggle. Like, I actually, I, I actually find it's a struggle that never ends. It's a problem that can't be solved for yeah. me, yeah. which is that I just think too much. And I want to I wanna be literal. Mm. And painting isn't, isn't literal, mm. you know? And so for me, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a challenge. I mean, every day, it's, it's thrilling. Mm. Can you just uh, tell me a bit about what the Morse messages actually are in these, and how they relate to the images? If they if they have any clear relationship. Here. Yeah, I mean it's hard with that going back to when I started started using words in the work. Um, I was very interested when I began using the Morse code and how often, Morse code was often used in emergencies to say something very, very, very important that had to be understood. Mm. So language was reduced, you know, to saying something as simply as possible. And uh, danger, emergency, death tends to share a language with sex. 
And I, and I, I thought that was just hilarious. That in the worst case scenario, when you're saying, you know, oh God, where are you? Whatever it is. Um, somebody reads it and thinks I'm making a sexy painting yeah. and so I, I began to kind of push that relationship yeah. um, with with you know kind of messages of terror that yeah. could be interpreted as messages of love yeah. so um, for example um, this one here says sorry <laughs> it's okay. says uh, Take me, leave me, fuck me, save me. Yeah. Which, which, I think kind of says it all. Yeah. You know, how do you encapsulate, you know, the the, the essence of of uh, fear and anxiety and yeah. conflict and all of that and desire? And the, I mean, even in a simple expression like "fuck me," it's like it it could be a it could also be an exclamation of horror, yeah, couldn't it? This just says "fuck." Yeah. And I think it's my favorite word in the English language. Yeah. For exact, it's the most elastic word. Yeah. And yeah. and the fact that you can't understand, and you be, and you it begins to have a relationship to to what's behind it. Um, to be perfectly honest, that the fire images started out as a f kind of a formal exercise where I was looking for an image to to uh, put behind this writing and to to see formally what what kind of interaction happened, mm. and. <clears throat> Um, I, f I feel as if, I mean, it, I picked an image of, of uh, 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 kind of a wildfire in a forest, mm. and, um, and it was, you know, it was just a simple, almost kind of a simple placeholder for, for lack of a better term, the sublime, for something frightening and beautiful and that has a lot of different kinds of connotations from hearth to you know disaster mm. and and um, I think I think because I wasn't looking for a complicated image with complicated meaning and I just decided that'll do yeah Fire does. There's, there's no doubt that at this point, the actual representation, the image behind the Morse code, uh, for me is is secondary, and mm. and it's it's um, I make it with a lot of thought about you know, just formally how it's going to yeah. work with with the, actual with the words, which I yeah. think because I'm coming from the words f first, that's still kind of foremost for me. Mm. But um, that, that's changing. I mean, this last painting I'm working on, yeah. you can see, if you look at it, like I'm, I'm getting excited about the picture. You know, I'm beginning to play with how I paint the picture. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's bound to happen. Yeah. You know? In fact, uh, just sitting here, I mean, because I have actually been slightly distracted looking at it, how the, the way you've done the, the sort of the wash with the uh, the red and the orange, um, does look uh, beautifully kind of fiery, um, and that's a, one of those little sort of formal technical exercises that you get into when you paint. I think it just it's happens. Like, you yeah. can't you can't really avoid it. Yeah. I, I find yeah. you know that that I've been I've been doing these these very sort of clinical drawings mm. for a long enough time that switching over to making you know more painterly paintings, I end up getting sucked into. To that. Yeah. Know. Now, um, you mentioned uh, something there also about the the idea of the sublime, right. um, which uh, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated with as well. Uh, from an art historical point of view, also how it's then articulated, particularly in images of war. Uh -huh. uh, there was a, a book I read recently called Art Power by Boris Groys, and he talks about the idea of have, when we think about the sublime, we tend to think of you know scary animals, big landscapes, you know JMW tuners, you know Hannibal right. in the Alps, and that kind of thing. Beer but, shot, right. Yeah, but there's a there is that element of the sublime that uh, someone like Edmund Burke talks about uh, that isn't often articulated through art, which is the idea of the political sublime. You know, which relates back to things like the, the terrors in 1793 right. when we were beheading the people right. in France and right. the Bastille Concord, and uh, so I think 
I, I can see certainly a, a an overlap here with what this language of the emergency right. and of war seems to right. deal with that notion of the political supply. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think that I truly don't believe that political art is necessarily an effective activism. Mm -hmm. And so I resist work that it, making work that is overtly political. Yeah. You know, I don't come at it from that point of view. But I'm a news junkie, I'm a politics junkie, it fills my brain and it seeps into the work, for sure. And certainly, to me, what's playing out in our world at the moment, and probably at any given time in history, is, is the political supply, no doubt about it. You know, it, it's a kind of rubbernecking fear and fascination. Yeah. The, when you said the, uh, when you made reference back to America and, you know, going to war, was, was that the... Was the first Bush one? Yeah. Bush one. I remember where I was. I remember I was in art school at the time. I remember pulling my car over. We, you know, we have gone to war. It was yeah. like this kind of radio statement. I remember my the hair going up on my arms and and this sense. I'm, I, I, a lot of the the sort of uh, warring activities, the Falklands, like the different things, hadn't really had that effect. This was like a loud made a loud noise and, mm -hmm. and it felt to me like my first in my lifetime, my first experience of my country aggressively, you know, being at war. It was, it, it had a very strong impact on me. Yeah, I, I think back to the same time, uh, I was just leaving high school at that point, but I remember, because I was at an age where I might have been drafted if right. things had got that right. Bad. Has been, you know, drafting in the UK, I think so yes. it's like yeah. But there was certainly that fear in the back yeah. of mind, and I think that's yeah. similar as well. Me too, me too. This thought of how is it go going to affect me? I mean, I, f I felt personally vulnerable. And this work really, uh, initially, um, I was dealing with, uh, interested in that sense of vulnerability, mm. you know, and the absurdity that seeps into the work and some of the language, I think, has to do with the fact that, you know, here in Southern California, by the ocean, like, we couldn't be more distant mm. from, from physically, f from this, these wars yeah. but um you wouldn't know that by you know what the way you're experiencing uh, the sort of the media and mm. and whatnot and it is a it the, this is i think that one of the fascinating things uh, particularly you know more recently with the war on terror as well uh that it is very much it's the it's a mediated war so our experience of it exactly. it's very geographically distant isn't exactly it? yeah Mm. Yeah, I'm. I'm really f fascinated. I mean, it takes a long time for this stuff to filter into your work in a way that's legible. Like you need some distance on it, I think, to understand, to 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 draw a connection. Mm. But I know that um, just the whole Benghazi, the recent mm. th uh, uh, attack in Libya on yeah. the the consulate, and all the protests that are going on. I find it fascinating that what we're seeing are these, you know, these, you know, violent protests and these angry people. And then every once in a while they'll pan out and say, well, it's actually 200 people and the rest of the city is going about its business. And you're just like, you know, it, you, one feels a little man manipulated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I find it, um, I've come from Australia. Australia is no, I think, less. Uh, no more or less insular than America is really yeah. in terms of its, its news. Yeah. Um, but I find it fascinating. I, I was watching the news this morning on CBS and they had a world map and it was uh, stories from around the world and four, four of the stories, three of them were for, from New York. <laughs> the fourth one was from London. It was actually about something specifically to do with America. Yeah. Which I thought was quite yeah. interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who's producing the news. <laughs> We're digesting. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's fascinating. I think. Yeah. Um, because this is, I think, uh, the, the wars that we, we have seen, you know, that America's been involved in the last 10 years have been very much uh, fought in the media. In, in the media. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean,. Uh, it was interesting. I had someone in my studio the other day, and I, in this particular work, I sort of play around with. Um, uh, uh, you can see how I have that sort of the, oh, the yeah. um, 
you know, the clear Morse code yeah. things. I, I moved them around on the painting and whatnot, yeah. and I had some along the bottom. And somebody came in and, and they said, "Oh, it's it's TV. You know, you're, you're you know the media association is the you know the writing that goes along yeah. at the bottom of the TV, which wasn't you know what I thought about at all. But it was the very first thing that that yeah. person thought about when they put together the idea of of uh, you know language and image. Mm -hmm. You know, they immediately thought of the TV. Well, we look at that's how we. It's not even picture books anymore. It's mm -hmm. it's you know." The TV, you know, just in case you don't understand what we're saying, it will write it down at the bottom for you. Mm, mm. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, uh, the inter one of the interesting things about Morse, um, as I understand, I might be wrong here, but Morse code um, is now an obsolete language as well, isn't it? It's, I don't Pretty know much. It's, no, it's, 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 it's in very sort of short forms, it's, mm. it's still used by sailors, right. you know. Uh, SOS and that kind of thing, but it's rarely used. One of my very first phrases I used, I loved this, it's so poignant, came from the French Navy's last Morse code message, like before Morse code was formally killed off. Yeah. And it said, um, uh, calling all, this is our last cry before our eternal silence. Uh. <laughs> I was just like, that is so Romantic. <laughs> That's a very French, isn't it? I, I know. <laughs> I used it. I stole that, man. I moved yeah. it around. I, I just loved it because there is something incredibly. Uh, I mean, it's the death of an alphabet. It's not the death yeah. of a language, but there is something kind of tragic about. I mean, you could also say it's the birth of code mm -hmm. as we as it's used today. It's mm -hmm. essentially a binary system. Yeah. You yeah. know. So you could say it wasn't the death of anything, it was the birth of something, but... You also um, have done a series of, uh, of sky pictures. Yes. Uh, tell me a bit about those. Well, we talk a little bit about wanting to be understood. Yeah. Those were really a reaction to... Um, do you mind if I get up and... Okay. I'll, I'll follow you then. Uh, I think it's... Uh, I think this came from that same calling all French statement. Yeah. But anyway, um, I had done the Morse code kind of cinematically, yeah. like, movie Star Wars. like movie credits, yeah. exactly. And suddenly they were floating in atmosphere, yeah. and and it became you know like a skyscape. Yeah. And um, and I began thinking about the ground for the Morse code that way, like. The, 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 the way uh, uh, the, the words were kind of evaporating in the air, yeah. going off into the atmosphere. And um, people kept, kept asking me what they meant. And so on one of these pictures, I was just in frustration, I just sprayed the, the translation on, mm. and it looked like sky writing. Oh, and I thought, well, you know something, maybe I'll abandon this Morse code and play around with sky writing, yeah. which I did. I did a series of paintings of sky writing which had its own kind of fascination for me because uh, I would set up the, the canvases on the wall and I'd write a phrase across all of them and then what you'd have is a word or two on each one, which is really how sky, you know, sky writing, you really get to see the phrase in its entirety. By the time you're at the end, the beginning has started to evaporate, yeah. you know? And so they had this kind of, they were sort of devoid of meaning and that they, uh, of literal meaning and that, and that you might have one or two words that that uh, you'd have associations with them, but we didn't necessarily know what the actual phrase had been. Mm. Um, and that was interesting to me, but uh, whatever, it had a beginning and an ending. I keep being drawn back to the Morse code for some reason. Mm. I'm not sure why. Usually I'm, I'm sort of done with, with uh, something sooner than that but I, I keep coming back to it I think I'm I'm really drawn to a lot of aspects of it not the least being just formally mm -hmm. you know th that it's just these simple 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 marks it's a dot and a dash and you can say everything with yeah, it it's, it's interesting I uh, do you know Guy de Quante no. the artist Guy de Quante he um, French artist is yeah. having a real 
revival right now. I, I've suddenly, I thought he was my own secret crush that nobody knew about. Yeah. I stumbled on this guy because uh, I was interested in other artists who have worked with, with code, with Morse code. And I stumbled, he's, he's not alive anymore, but he actually spent some time in California in the 60s. Um, he did a lot of work with language where he would, he did one performance piece using Morse code, how I stumbled on him, but I found a portfolio of drawings online. He did a lot of work where he um, uh, played with the shape of letters, a lot of work with where the letters were written like mirror writing, you know, where, the, where, where words were written backwards. And the phrases were very mundane and personal, you yeah. know, having to do with like the day he was having or whatever. That wasn't what the work was about. I, clearly, like me, he got caught up in um, the aesthetics of it, the the idea of um, uh, what is the meaning behind the literal meaning. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's led me into an interest in medi in uh, idioms. I mean, this piece there with the silver leaf yes. uh, comes from a German idiom, right. which it, it says, um, well, that particular piece says, tell me where the dog lies buried, right. which is a German phrase, which, which, I mean, idioms are wonderful because if you don't, if you, if you don't speak that language, if you don't really live that language, yeah. they, they can't be translated literally. But it, it, it's basically like, you know, where is the source of the, of the, of the problem? Yeah. You know, where's the needle in the haystack kind of thing? And I'm interested in the literal meaning. I mean, I, I, I don't care so much what the, what the idiom means, yeah. but I care a lot about this phrase yeah. that, mean, that is completely nonsensical unless you've got the key. Yeah, and that's, that's another layer of the, the, the language and the loss of translation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that idea is more exciting to me than, than what it's actually saying. Yeah, and the thing is, the interesting thing is with idioms, often uh, people who use them, you know, we often use idioms that we've got no idea what the origin is. What the origin is of it, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, when somebody tells us the, the, the trivia of, about uh, an idiom, you know, it's yeah. often a surprise. I love it. I love that stuff. Mm. I, part of it could come from, I lived in, in France, I went, I've lived in a country where initially I didn't speak the language. Mm. And I was so tickled by the types of mistakes I would make, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, it's like watching the brain tick. Yeah. and try to make connections and it's more like listening to a two-year-old starting to speak you know yeah. it's, it's it tells you something about how our minds work mm. you know yeah just a broader question about um about current art practice in los angeles as yes. well because um there seems to be a, a sort of a uh, a movement no not even a movement i suppose that's put into some there seems to be a general kind of move towards abstraction in that LA at the moment. That um, I don't know if, that is, if that's your perception. Is, is that your perception? My perception is that art trends are moving at the speed of light. Yeah. That uh, nothing is even around long enough to call a movement. There, there are a lot of artists here. There are all sorts of communities, and I, just, I, I did. It did seem as if, as galleries, you know, it, around 2008 or so, mm. galleries just started closing one after another. It was like the whole system was toppling. Mm. And artists just began to make their own things happen. They kept having shows out of, you know, warehouses and studios and in the middle of the street and, you know, whatever. And um, I think there's, I, I actually am involved with two different artist groups. And uh, even now that I have gallery representation, um, and those kind of um, sort of commercial venues, there's a kind of vitality and room for experiment yeah. that happens in an artist community, in an artist-run space. Yeah. Uh, they are rarely based in, in commercialism. They're not, you know, they're rare. They don't become a business till you have rent to pay. Mm. You know. Um, even when there's rent to pay, most of the artist run spaces I know are done on a dime, mm. intentionally. Yeah. yeah, I think there's some, some exciting stuff going on. So in terms of in terms of support, when, for instance, an artist has just left art school, what is the trajectory? What what is the yeah? What are, what are the support mechanisms and 
I can really only, there, there are none. There are none in terms of, you know, some kind of infrastructure that's there to help you out. Yeah. And it's, I don't think, I know the art school, I went to uh, California Institute of the Arts. It's yeah. a terrific program. Uh, there's nothing in the way of, and here's what you do when you leave school. Yeah. Um, in fact, you know, be, because art really isn't about commerce, yeah. they, they, I think it's very purposeful that, you know, that they don't intend to spend a lot of time. To, you, you can figure out the commerce and that's not what art is about and that's not what we're teaching yeah. here. Um, do they teach anything about um, sort of professional practice, you know, no. law and, you know? No. no. Uh, they do in some art schools. Uh, there's, there's one, there was one instructor that's fought for years to have a class. I told you I took a class that involved grant writing and whatnot, but yeah. but um, that was I think she had a lot of resistance to to even the idea of, of this kind of a class. So in my own experience, um, the first thing I did was look to my peers, to mm. the people I'd met in art school, to the people had, who had gone through in, to other art schools, and I got involved with a community of my peers. Mm. Um, I remember speaking once with uh, John Baldessari when I was thinking about going to graduate school and not really sure if I should go to graduate school if I need it. I had about almost 10 years of practicing as an artist prior to going back and, and going to graduate school. And I asked him about, because he had taught in graduate schools, how he felt about that. And he said he had success way late in his career and that if it weren't for peer support, he would not have been able to maintain his practice. That it's, it's kind of everything, it's very, very important. And that was a big that was a big part of you know ha having having peers to dialogue with yeah. uh, was very very important to me and it it ended up being very important when I left school um, that certainly led to uh, the artist groups that I'm involved I'm involved with uh, one called the LA Art Girls yeah. which is really a group that mostly dialogues all women in LA yeah. uh, having the kind of conversations you have in graduate school yeah. that are so hard to come by once you yeah. leave school you know you people come become very polite in each other's studios yeah. once they leave school yeah. so uh, it's mostly an online thing we, we don't right. you know LA's really spread around we yeah. rarely get together yeah. you know and then Durden and Ray the group I have with Max yeah. and others is uh, really more of an exhibition initiative so the online one, is it, is it like a discussion board that you actually... It's like a discussion board, yeah. you know, all sorts of topics come up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I think it's, it sort of ended up being a, a group of... of mm -hmm. it w initially it was a few women meeting at a bar periodically to talk about art. Yeah. And it sort of grew out of that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the discussion has to do with uh, the particular issues of being female yeah. in the arts. Yeah. Uh, the the one of the important things I think from art school, and this is something I think about a lot myself because of the, the job that I have at the moment. Yeah. One of the important things I think is that you know that peer support that uh, peer support makes it sound too almost bureaucratic. It's it's the or networking or something. Yeah, that you have when you're at art school. I think that they they're really. Vital. That's one For of the me, get from my most interesting conversations about art happen with other artists. Yeah. They happen in the studios. They, you know, um, a lot of the things I I'm really interested in talking about. There is a language um, that that that's developed. Yeah. That um, you know you can you share a language and you're you know you're able to. To, to talk and uh, and even I mean it's very important when you're when you're when you're down and it's very important when you're up and uh, for me it's it's great to you know see how many people sort of soldier on mm. you know in what isn't necessarily the most you know lucrative uh, pursuit. Do you find that there's uh, uh, over the years um, a sort of a a fairly high attrition rate, really, with, with your peers, for instance. You know, not as high as I thought there would be. Oh, that's right. I, I really thought, I remember in graduate school asking my dean, um, what do these people do when they get out of school? Yeah. I felt as if I saw a lot of undergraduates in the program, and I looked at them and I just thought, you know, they were young, they were maybe 22 years old, what? they're not all going to be artists. 
Mm. And he, he said, you know, they're not all artists, but they tend to do interesting things, mm. you know. Uh, in my own graduate program, which wasn't super big, people tend to go out and become artists. Now, many artists today, most of the artists I know that are my peers have a job as well yeah. of some kind. Yeah. You know, I don't know that many artists of my generation that can afford to, that live off their work, yeah. 100%. I mean, I, there was a time when, when I was younger where I would remember being told by gallers they wouldn't touch someone who had a real job. Like, that implied a lack of seriousness. Right. But um, that's just not feasible for me. No, that's just reality. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, well, anyway, I talked to you a little bit about um, where, where, you know, when language first started showing up in my work. Yeah. Uh, this was when I was working on... on uh, kind of a sur survivalist ideas. And I decided to make, I went onto survivalist websites mm. and I was just inundated with the amount of supplies, mm. with all the different things one could, one could buy to be ready for the big disaster. Mm. And um, so I decided to make a, a, a survival manual. And it started out where I was, uh, this was a very, no, this one of them, the first one I made basically, I listed without looking everything I could imagine one would need in a disaster. Yeah. Um, from there, I decided to, to um, try to cross-reference. This is a cross-reference of, uh, of disasters to supplies, where, where you, know, you can be ready if you get these things for you know, biological warfare and drought and pandemic flu and volcanic eruption and, yeah. and flood and whatnot. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's absurd, but... It's also incredibly uh, sort of seductive when you get into it. You can't really stop. Was there was uh, did this come about? And I'm just guessing here. Did this come about after 9/11? Because there was this kind of surge yeah. of interest in we, survivalism, wasn't we there? We started getting, you know, you know, uh, the government had this this uh, color system. Yeah. You know, it yes, would be like right. code orange, which it means it's, it's really dangerous. But but just be more alert than usual. Like yeah. for what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I'm sure. I mean, I, I know. Yeah. That was part of it. That you saw the humor in it, but it yeah. still made you anxious, you know. Yeah. And uh, and I'm I'm kind of anxious by by nature. I'm wound a little tight. Um, this this piece isn't so much how to, but um, yeah. I was thinking about defensive walls. Like that's one of the things people do is they build walls to keep the danger out. Mm. And I started looking up defensive walls around the world, and I yeah. decided to make a list of every defensive wall currently still standing in the world yeah and um and that's that's what this list is and uh it's called paper wall because these defensive walls are virtually never um useful for what for, for for the reasons mm. they were built yes. you know they they're useful in all, all sorts of other ways yeah uh but but and but in fact they, often they, they're an administrative political I mean you only have to think of the building wall exactly yeah. exactly or or the you know the fence in Israel and and yeah. and whatnot they often become the, ch the great ideological Chinese wall you know yeah whatever it's called um, they become it becomes all about how to get over it and through it and under it and, yeah and it's um really a site of enormous human ingenuity um, so this yeah this work is just language heavy and you're not, you know, I don't really expect anybody to sit and read every bit of writing. It's the idea that there's so much of it, yeah. you know, that you yeah. just start to pick up on the, um, the idea that there's way more information here than one could possibly mm. absorb. Um, uh, and I just went on and on. In fact, I would do ah. this when paintings were, were drawing. You know, we have these yeah. periodic, you know, fear clusters yes and sometimes yeah. it's about bird flu yeah. <laughs> you know what not so yeah I, I put together a bird flu kit and um, this is one of my favorite ones because at a certain point I decided to start making all the things they're so expensive on the internet these disaster supplies and I began mm. re seeing that nearly everything could be made with plastic and duct tape right and so I began <laughs> to make everything that I'd been illustrating and I, out of trash bags and duct tape, I, um, I made something that can be a tarp yeah. or a personal privacy shelter. We yeah. still have to go to the bathroom, you know, mm. um, a dress, an outfit. So this is just really about all the uses uh, 
for for and you can seal windows with all the uses for mm. large trash bags and duct, duct tape. tape probably the two most important things to have in a disaster and <clears throat> This is a few years ago that I did this project and it goes on and on and on and in fact the only time I installed it I did it as a big wall installation yeah. even though I think of it as a, as a manual you know mm -hmm. as a book originally I was gonna gonna Xerox it and have it be a book and and it just never was that but do you, th do you go think ahead. Is, uh, do you think there is something of and I just say this as, a, as an outsider. Yeah. Do you think there's something of living in LA about this idea of disaster preparation as well? Because people, you know, are always very conscious about, you know, the potential of the big one. Uh, that's th that could be part of it, but it also coincides with um, a couple of hours from LA, the Mojave Desert. I got a mm. little cabin yeah. with my husband, and uh, it's kind of the middle of nowhere. Right. It's very yes. sort of dry, and um, happens to be near an army base. Right. So you'll be out there blissing out <laughs> and these fighter jets yeah. and will suddenly go overhead and you'll kind of be reminded of, of you know, mm. the super real world. And also you start meeting people who are serious survivalists, who have yeah. bunkers and stuff. Like that's real big. You get further out from yeah. the city, you meet people who are going out there just to be just to be away from from danger and whatnot, and yeah. um, there's there's a that is a to me that's a very American thing that that you know it's it's a very mainstream activity, isn't it? Actually, that survivalism much and, more mainstream than I thought when yeah. I began. I mean, I yeah. started out, you know, I really am anxious, but I'm not someone that ever really prepared for disaster. Mm. And I know when I started, it was a I think part of it was about trying to get a handle on this kind of free-floating anxiety like mm. like can one control it and um, I entered into a very interesting world that it's it's it, it is way more mainstream mm. it is way more mainstream it's 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 I think it it's connected to our Second Amendment rights you yeah. know this yeah. this idea that um, we all have the right to bear arms yeah and and people um, bring that back to being able to protect yourself from mm. from danger, mm. you know, it's very American. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, and and anyway, to bring us forward a few years, I didn't even make the connection at the time, but I came across people know I'm interested in code, and so they send me all sorts of things. And a yeah. friend of mine sent me a manual that um, is for the Air Force that basically has all sorts of air to land and land to air um, signals. Yeah. Uh, for different situations, and they they're really wonderful little illustrations yeah. um, that at the, I'm really just copying because they're so. Well, I guess if you aren't in class being told what they mean, I'm not sure you would know what they mean. <laughs> and what I'll tell you, I'll show you my drawing yeah, of it, yeah. which this particular one I really love because it says um, "message received and not nice. understood." That is what this drawing says. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, it looks an awful lot as if the plane has, has, is, is dropping something and, and, and perhaps wiping out a village. Yeah. <laughs> what the like fuck cluster, does it mean? <laughs> yeah. And I don't know what it means, yeah, yeah. but that is definitely the way I'm interpreting it. Yeah. And so, <laughs> Um, um, message me, message you know received why and understood, yeah. you know. I get it, I hear you. I mean, they're so funny and they're so yeah. scary if this is what our Air Force is using, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so Again, it's that thing about losing in translation, isn't it? Losing in translation, definitely. So I've just, I've just started this manual. I, I love that uh, there was one that you just showed there which says, pick us up. And it's just someone. Uh, it's just someone with their arms raised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a bit of desperation about it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. And I, I really love the sort of workmanlike, you know, drawings. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So who produces these? Uh, these kind of. Th this is actually the government. FAA. Yeah. Dot gov. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be afraid. Be very yeah. afraid. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and 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 for me, it's it's it uh, it comes back to this kind of um, communication schism, yeah. you know, which which is like, this is such important information, yeah. and you know, it's come into my hands quite easily, and I don't understand it, 
you know yeah. the language is simple the meaning is not yeah so to, to me it's it's rich stuff yeah and to me it seems to be very much a you know uh resonating with the idea of slippage of meaning in art just yeah you know generally yeah. yeah oh definitely definitely I mean I mean I think one of the reasons I started bringing imagery back into this work is is to slippage in meaning with language is actually mm. an easier thing to wrap your head to grasp than yeah. slippage of meaning in pictures yeah. in the pictorial you know yeah and um i wanted to explore that that way and also in the slippage of meaning between the image and the and the words yeah and images i mean are, are very slippery I think. very slippery yeah. very slippery yeah mm. yeah and i'm like you i i i tend towards wanting concrete meaning to try to want to nail it down yeah and it's that kind of um area of play yeah. that keeps me coming back you know usually for mm. me once I've really nailed something down I'm no longer making good work and it's time to move on mm. like I get that that's not the most interesting part but it's certainly what's driving me yeah you know thank you very much Claudia for talking to us today and the best of luck for your practice in the future thank you